If you are new to the Sutta study, okay, sometimes it's very really confused. It is said there are more than 80,000 teachings of the Buddha. Where should I start? Sutra is the collection of the teaching of the Buddha where he teach 45 years. There is the Vinaya Pitaka, Sutta Pitaka, and Abhidhamma Pitaka. Vinaya is about the rules. There are eight books in Thai. Sutta Pitaka, 25 books. And Abhidhamma is another 12 books. You see how much of teaching kept in each basket, there are three baskets. The first basket is Vinaya, second basket is the Sutta. In this particular basket is the collection of the teaching of the Buddha, 45 years. Wherever he went, whoever he met, he keep the teaching. And that teaching are kept in this basket. And it's divided into the Tika Nikaya, which is the long discourse, the middle length discourse, and the minor discourse, there are all kinds of sutra, all kinds of uh, teaching that kept in this Pitaka. If you just suddenly jump into it, you may get confused. So later on, I'll show you the idea of the Pitaka, how it designed and the layout of each basket. And so we get to see the, the picture of what's kept in each basket. When we talk about sutta study, we are focusing on the second basket, this basket, which is said again, is about 21,000 teaching that kept in this basket. <laughs> There's a lot of teaching. After years of study, I realized that the, the teaching of the Buddha point to same thing. Whichever sutta that you pick, whoever he met, he teach the same concept. Okay, the concept of the truth, the liberation, the understanding, the right understanding. When someone comes to the Buddha, the Buddha help to heal, to heal the suffering of that individual that come and see him. I found one single sentence that the Buddha, he compared his teaching to the ocean. Even though there are many oceans in this world, but every ocean have the same taste, which is the, the taste of salt. It's salty. His teaching is the same. If you jump into his teaching, if you understand it and put into practice correctly, all of you will taste the same thing, and that taste is called the liberation. You will be liberated from whatever suffering that you are having or experiencing. That's the idea of study Dhamma. Today I'm going to take you to one of the teachings of the Buddha. It's called, the name of the sutra is called Maha Saropama. Maha Saropama Sutta from the middle length, this course of the Buddha number 29, when you see MN, MN short for middle length, okay? And the name of the sutra is this one, Mahasaropama, which you have no idea what it means because it's in Pali. And usually when you go to the text in English, uh, the translator usually give the translation of what it means, so you can guess. It said, the greater this course on the simile of the hardwood. Even though we may see a few keywords here, but we still not fully understand what the, what the sutra is talking about. We see the words uh, greater, right? Something big. This course is the teaching. Simile is something like comparison. Comparison of the hardwood. What is the hardwood? Okay. So sometimes the name, we cannot tell a lot of things from the name. Sometimes the name can be the name, the name of Sutta can be the name of the people, can be the name of the town, can be the name of the situation. It depends. That's, that's, there is no uh, standard structure of how they put the name of each Sutra. So you need to know the meaning uh, when you go through the Sutra. And this Sutra, I think it's considered a little bit advanced. If you study by yourself, you go through it quickly, you, even though you can read English, you understand English, it doesn't mean that you understand the teaching of the Sutra fully. That is why studying Sutra is quite challenging. You need someone who has high experience, so they can help you to clarify something, some vocabulary and some... Um, uh, they can help you to connect the dot. You may come across the similar sutra, but you don't know how they link, how they connect to each other. So this one, from the same 
uh, collection, the Mashima Nikaya number 29. This is the sutta that we are learning today. And if you go to the next sutta, sutta number 30, you find another sutta with similar name. Okay, the first one is called Maha, right? Maha Saro Pama Sutta. And the second one is called Chula Salo Pama Sutta. Okay. <laughs> Maha means great, greater. Chula means shorter or smaller. Saro, Saro Sara, Sara or Saro means core, essence. Okay, or hardwood, this one. Hardwood in the heart is something important. Cause, essence, something important. Okay, and sutra again means the teaching, right? Sometimes you see the word maha often. So you keep in mind that when you hear the word, the name of the sutra is maha, that means that teaching, you can expect something long. It's a long teaching, something big, something greater. And there should be something that come along with it that called jula, or shorter or smaller. If you like, you can start from the shorter one, or you can just go ahead and go to the full version or with the greater one. But they pretty much almost identical, but just add on more detail when it comes to maha or the greater sutra. So in this case, maha means greater, saro or sara means core essence or the hardwood. Okay, something, something something, the meat, something important that the Buddha is about to explain. And when you open up the sutra, you need to keep in mind that, okay, where did the Buddha give the talk? Who did he talk to? And what's the purpose of that talk? And what's happened at the end of that talk, that Dhamma teaching? So just keep in mind so you understand. So today I'm going to walk you through, let's say if you experience the sutta study for the first time, you come and learn to see how the sutra is organized, how what is the style, the writing style that that, that uh, present in the Buddhist text. But again, keep in mind another information that the the Tipitaka is written in Pali, Theravada Tipitaka, original originated from Pali version. What we learn today is English version. Of course, somebody has to translate it from Pali to English. If you study in Thai language, someone has to translate it from Pali to Thai. Same thing in Chinese. If you can read Chinese, the Chinese version also translates from the Pali language. Please do not rely on one translator. Because Pali, one vocabulary can translate to many meanings. If you get confused, you check with another translator, at least two or three translators. Then you see different vocabulary that use, so it helps you to understand. Okay, uh, it's, it's broaden your understanding. Maybe this vocabulary you not understand. Let's say, how do you translate the word samadhi? The Pali is samadhi. Enrique may translate samadhi to relaxation. Lumpilio may translate samadhi to concentration. David may translate samadhi to unification of mind. Mikael may translate to undistract mind. Jet may say, oh, samadhi is the stillness of the mind. <laughs> so what is samadhi then? What is the proper translation? Good question. Good question. Good question. You need to, sometimes, what happens when we talk about experience, we, we have a hard time to find the word. What the Buddha teach is a direct experience. This experience, when, when this thing happens, it's called samadhi. And when now we, we try to explain what is samadhi in, in the human language. Okay, the classic definition of the word samadhi that's explained in the Visuddhimakkha is called the unification of mind. The mind becomes unifying. Which is again the same thing with undistracted mind, right? If the mind still distracts, the mind cannot be unified. But when we hear the word unification, that means at least two things need to combine. A few things need to be unified. You cannot unify one item. You don't say that. Unify at least a few things together. And that's come to the next question. What exactly is being unifying? They don't explain that in the text. But the Master, he explained that. 
the unifi- unification of my means that your sensation, your feeling, perception, thought, and cognition become unifying. And to be specific, unify where? No answer to. Unify at the center of the body, and that's the answer from the master. Okay? So your job is to be able to explain. When the kids ask you, you go home, your nephew may ask you, Long Pi, and okay, what is Samadhi? You have been meditating for one year. <laughs> you need to be able to answer that, okay? So that's the challenge when it comes to Sutta study. Okay, so today let's see if we can understand. So I will open up with this sentence and I will also end the teaching with this the same sentence to see if you can connect the dot of the story that the Buddha is about to share with us today. This holy life, bhikkhu, sometimes you hear the word bhikkhu or monk or medicant. There are a few words that use often in the text, which mean the same thing. Does not, this holy life means this ordination, when someone become a monk, does not have gain, honor, renounce for its benefit, or the attainment, the attainment of virtue for its benefit, or the attainment, the attainment of concentration for its benefit, or the knowledge and vision for its benefits, but it is the uncheckable deliverance of mind that is the goal of this holy life. It's the hard work, it's the end. So this sutra is telling us that the Buddha will take us to what is the ultimate goal when someone become a monk. We can put it that way. The hard work that means something, something important, something essential. When you become a monk, you need to know what is essential for you to be a monk, to be achieved in your spiritual life, right? Like this picture. You now, you come from a layman, you become a monk for some reason, but you may not have a clear idea where this life can take me, how far can I go. You may enjoy meditation, you may enjoy observing precept, enjoy mindfulness, enjoy simple life, but is that the core of someone becoming a monk? Is there anything else besides this simple life, relaxed life, slow life, secluded, peaceful, happy? Is that it? No. The goal is here. The goal is the ultimate goal is here. This is the essence of the teaching. It's called liberation. The explanation that we can find in this teaching. Okay, so we'll come back to this later. Okay, I'll give you the whole picture or the overview of the sutra first. All right, we have been talking about the monastic training. Let me review you one more time because this is very helpful to understand this teaching. Because the Buddha is going to take us to the essence of spiritual life, the holy life, right? So when someone becomes a monk, you are here. This is your first month of your ordination. And now you walk on the path day by day, you may not know where are you going. What is the ultimate goal of me becoming a monk? The Buddha will give us the answer in this particular sutra. Because many monks in the past, they, they get trapped along the way. So they fall off the, the track, they cannot achieve the highest goal when someone becomes a monk. So the spiritual training, this is from Mahasapura Sutra that uh, Lung Pi mentioned uh, earlier. There are ten steps when you come to the teaching of the Buddha for you to be success. Not only being a good monk, but also a good monk with successful in your spiritual life. You need to walk down this, this ten step. And the Buddha introduced you Hiri Otapa, right? Hiri Otapa, and then purify body, speech, and thought. This is your sila. And then purify pure in life, livelihood. How can we live life? according to the teaching of the Buddha that consider pure livelihood. We shouldn't go around and ask things for the lay people, right? There are details on, on each one of them as well. Number four, sense control. Number five, moderate in eating. Number six, practice wakefulness. Don't lazy in when it comes to meditation. Number seven, develop uh, the purity of mindfulness and awareness. And number eight, abandoning hindrances, remove hindrances. And then that monk will enter the state of jhana and he will access to the super knowledge, 
or a p i n y a Sometimes you hear three knowledge. Sometimes you hear six knowledge. Sometimes you hear eight knowledge. Today, I'm going to show you the six knowledge, because this also hidden when the Buddha explained the teaching. So this teaching the Buddha gave, I think, he gave to uh, monks who good at meditation already, not just the new monks. And there will be something that involved in this ten process as well. So I'll, let me give you this information out front, then we can connect the dot later on. Uh, you see sila already here, right? And samadhi already here. Samadhi, this one. Actually, this one. And this is wisdom. Sila samadhi panya. Sila samadhi panya. You cannot go wrong, okay, with these three framework. You may not know which one is which one, but you actually, if you can track it down, you will be surprised that hey, I'm actually follow this framework. Sila samadhi panya. This one. Sila samadhi and panya. That's why many people said, most of the teacher would said, all the teaching of the Buddha, 84,000 teaching, can be summarized into three groups: the group of sila, the group of samadhi, and the group of panya. It's easy to understand. And now your job is to understand what it means by sila, development of sila, the development of mind, and the development of panya or wisdom. So every sutra that you will be study from now on, I like you. To come back to this and related to this, which one the Buddha talk about sila, which one the Buddha talk about samadhi, which one he talk about panya. This is the first paragraph on the teaching. So now let's take a look to see if you can understand. Thus I have heard. Who have heard? Most sutra start from this sentence. Thus I have heard. That means somebody heard something, heard this teaching from the Buddha, and that person usually ananda. His personnel attendant, his secretary. Remember, uh, while the Buddha was still alive, there was no writing. The Buddha go give a dharma talk. When the Buddha come back, he will share this, the, the the teaching that he gave to Ananda. And Ananda has the privilege to listen to the Buddha teaching. If Ananda did not go with him, let's say he do something at the temple, the Buddha will. Go out and he come back. He will he will explain to Ananda that today I meet this person and I teach him or teach her this teaching. So that's the privilege of become the Buddha personal attendant. Ananda has a good memory. He memorizes everything. Amazing. And after the Buddha passed away, within that three months, 500 arahan, 500 monk, gather together to verify the teaching of the Buddha. So Ananda happened to be the one who. Those five four hundred ninety nine monks ask Ananda the question, and Ananda will reconfirm that this is what the Buddha teach. Because the Buddha meet with many monks, he talk, give many talk. Every teaching that he teach will go to Ananda. Ananda will be the one who verify that the, he have heard that teaching. That how most of the sutta start off with this sentence. So, if you come here for the first time, you may have doubt who heard what, who say what. So Ananda heard this teaching, and 500 years after the Buddha passed, the his teaching put into the writing format for the first time, and this is the 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 writing style that appears in the Buddhist text. Thus I have heard. Okay, thus Ananda heard the teaching of the Buddha. This is what the Buddha said. So listen to me. On one occasion, the blessed one. This is the name. The blessed one. Sometimes you hear the blessed one, the awakened one. The enlightened being. There are many names that use here, which point to the same person, which is the Buddha. Was living at Rajakaha or Rajakru on the mountain named Voucher Peak. It was soon after Tevatatta had left there, referring to Tevatatta. The blessed one addressed the bhikkhu thus. Okay, this is the opening scene of the sutra. What we have learned here. So far, okay. Ananda heard the teaching of the Buddha that one time the Buddha was in r a s h a k a h a in the mountain called Voucher Peak, and there's a name here as well. Mention the name t e w a t a t t a After t e w a t a t t a has left, oh, okay. Now we kind of see the picture that the Buddha give this teaching after the monk named t e w a t a t t a left the sangha, left the order. You may not know who is t e w a t a t t a 
today, let's get to know him a little bit because it's useful. So each teaching of the Buddha, there is a story behind that. Why the Buddha give the teaching? What happened before that? What happened in that moment? Is there a war? Is that the uh, uh, natural disaster? Sometimes earthquake, sometimes the wind, sometimes the flood. People are suffering. Then the Buddha give the talk, this and that. When you once you understand the context around, you know the the teaching, it helps you to understand better. So this teaching was given after Thevatthatta. This monk left the Buddha, left the Sangha. Who is the Thevatthatta? Thevatthatta. Through the lens of Theravada, Theravada Buddhism, Theravada is a notorious monk, the monk who always gives problems to the Sangha and to the Buddha. He is the one who tries to kill the Buddha. He is the one who makes plan and try to take over the Sangha. He wants to become the leader of the Sangha. Sangha means monk community that led by the Buddha himself. He even walked to the Buddha and asked that, I like to be in charge. The Buddha rejects his request. He requests that monk should do these five things for the rest of his life. Whoever ordained, you must follow these five things. This is my idea. So he proposed this idea to the Buddha. You stay in the forest forever. You leave only arms. If you don't go arms now, you cannot have food. You cannot receive food from the lay people. Even though you are in the temple, the lay people come and offer food, you have to reject that. You wear the robes that made from the rags, collect from dust, collect from dead bodies, from the cemetery. You don't receive the robe that ready made for you. And number four, you live not only in the forest, you don't live underneath the shed, uh, in the cave. You live, you stay it at the foot of tree. And number five, you have to become vegetarian. <laughs> You're not allowed to eat fish or meat for the rest of your life. This is his request to the Buddha. The Buddha said, no, you don't have to do that. You can stay anywhere, secluded in the forest, in the cave. You can go arms round or you can wait. If the lay people come offer food, you can receive. And you can get the robe that the lay people offer as well. And you also allow to stay in the shelter like this, in the hut. You also allow to eat meat. If the meat meets with these three conditions. Number one, you don't order someone to kill for you. Number two, you don't hear. Number, number three, you don't see. And number four, you don't have doubt that meat is killed for you. This is the criteria to be used whether the meat is pure, the meat can be eaten or not. Okay, let's say if you walk into the seafood restaurant, you see the big lobster is swimming in the front in the glass, right? And then you tell the waiter, I'd I like to take this one, this guy. No, you order that lobster to be killed. Monk cannot do that. You cannot do that. Okay, but if you are here and all of a sudden the lay people come and bring you, you know, garlic lobster, then it's okay according to the precept. Because you don't know where it comes from. You did not ask for the menu. You don't specifically them to re uh, request them to kill the lobster for you. So that's the idea. So these are the five requests that the Thevatthatta approached the Buddha and asked permission. The Buddha said no. Then Thevatthatta said, okay, you know what? Whoever feel like these five things is appropriate and like my idea, you come, become, you come with me and become my student. So 500 monks go with Thevatthatta, separate the temple, separate the location. They just go and learn from Thevatthatta. So they separate from the Buddha. So Thevatthatta break the Sangha into two groups. This is the bad sin, the bad merit. Who is Thevatthatta anyway? Thevatthatta is the cousin of the Buddha. Before the Buddha ordained, Prince Siddhartha get married with the sister of Thevatthatta. Princess Pimpa or Yasothara is the sister of this monk Thevatthatta. So they get married. So by default, Thevatthatta is the cousin of the Buddha. And when someone comes to the temple, most of the lay people would look for, where is the Buddha? Where is Mokhalana? Where is Saliputta? Where are those great monks, well-known monks? Nobody asks, where is Thevatthatta? And when this happened, his ego, come on, I was born prince too. I was in the same rank too. How come people don't look for me? So he has such a thought. 
and that starts start building up. So he's looking for somewhere, uh, the way to become famous, the way to gain recognition as well. So this slowly build up until he get to the point where he want to take control or to be in charge of the Sangha, have the Buddha removed. So he planned to kill the Buddha. And this one, this picture, the Thevatatta was trying to throw the big rock while the Buddha was walking past by, intentionally to kill the Buddha. But the na- Buddha nature, one of the Buddha nature, is no one can kill the Buddha. You can hurt him, you cannot kill him. So this big rock cannot hit the Buddha, but it's hit another rock, and it's that rock break into the small pieces, and this small piece of rock hit the foot of the Buddha. He get hurt badly, but he did not die. The Buddha said, Oh, Thevatatta, you have done such a bad karma. Such a bad karma. Story short, later on, uh, he realized that he had done such a great sin, or uh, such an extremely bad demerit or bab. He come and ask forgiveness for the Buddha, and he cannot finish his forgiveness. He got sucked down by the earth completely, so he died. He reborn in the deepest hell realms. This day he is still there. And the text says, Thevatatta will become one of the Pacheka Buddha in the future. He will become one of the Pacheka Buddha. There are two kinds of Buddha, right? Sama Samputta Buddha, the Buddha who achieve enlightenment and teach the world, and Pacheka Buddha, the Buddha who can teach himself to free himself from the defilement, but he don't have the teaching skill, so he doesn't teach. So Thevatatta, after he finished doing his time in hell realm, keep come back to a higher realm, become a human, start accumulating merit, you know, purify himself, pursue the perfection, and one day he will become the Pacheka Buddha. And that's what the text says. You see, this is the story of one of important figure that mentioned in the Buddhist text. He was born in a high family, born prince, good education, powerful, ordained with faith, advanced meditator. He has ability to do things, access to the super knowledge where normal monk or normal human being cannot do. He can do all kind of that thing. But he still end up suffering, end up dying and reborn in hell realms. For us, I don't think we can meditate as good as he did. Okay? But make sure that you preserve the right view. Right view is very important. And once you start feeling that, well, people should look for me as well. I'm a famous prafarang here. You know, I want to be famous. I want to get recognition. Be careful with that thought. It starts from a little thing like this. So this teaching, to me, is very... Uh, I, I really connected to it, and I really like it. So then the Buddha said, Bhikkhu, hear some cleansed men. I mean you guys, people from the, lay, the laymen, go forth. That means you leave home, right? Living home life into homelessness. Basically, you ordain, you ban pasha. Ban pasha means live, lay life completely. The group of people like that come to the teaching, understand the teaching, and want to become a monk, want to live life, uh, want to live spiritual life fully from home to be a homelessness. He considering that I am a victim of birth, aging, death, and sorrow, lamentation, grief, pain, and despair. I am also a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. You see, people come to the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha talk about the Four Noble Truths, the nature of life, the Dukkha, the Tanha, and the Eight Four Path. They understand that teaching, and they cannot live, they can no longer live life as a lay person. They want to realize the same thing that the Buddha realized. They want to achieve Nibbana. They want to get rid of the whole mass of suffering, or Dukkha. This is a typical case where most people, why most people ordain. And how come? Later on, when he has gone forth, that means after his ordination, he acquire, gain, honor, renounce. He is pleased with that gain, honor, and renounce, and his intention is fulfilled. So let's continue first and then come back to understand it later. 
on account of it, he lost himself, self so praise And this praise others that, hey, you know what? I am the one who get gain. I am, I am the one who get gains and renounced. But these other bhikkhu or other monks, they are not well known as myself, okay, of no account. So he becomes intoxicated or addicted to what? To the gain, honor, renounce, and grow negligence. He becomes careless. He fall into negligence. He becomes careless again. And being in negligence, he lives in suffering or dukkha. This is the third paragraph. So when a man ordained, he has faith, you know, everything's good, I want to end my dukkha or suffering, so I, be, I want to become a monk, so I leave home to be a homelessness, follow the teaching of the Buddha. And eventually, this monk falls into this trap of gain, honor, and renounce. Why? See, people ordain with a good intention. And many people back then ordain become a monk. Some from the farmer, from poor family, from the middle class family, from the high soul family, from the king families. There are all kind of people become a monk for some reason. Initially, I believe they have a good intention, understand nature of life, want to free themselves from dukkha. And later on, they realize that, hey, life is so sabai here. Life is so relaxed here. I don't have to work. Food is free for life. You start seeing the benefit of being a monk. You start seeing your friends get recognition, become famous, and he get more invitation, he get more benefit, get more supporter. He get, lay people may offer the land, build a beautiful temple for him. And now you start feeling that, wow, this is interesting. Let me become like that. So this is a wrong view. So this monk get trapped into the realm of attachment to gain, to become famous, to become popularities, to get an honor. And he is pleased with that. Now, not only he looking for it, he looking for it, he find it, he find the lay supporter, he get more fan, more uh, f- uh, followers, and he enjoy, he pleased with that. Now I'm a famous monk. People know me. I I'm, I'm give a good Dhamma talk. I'm, I'm a meditation teacher. Come and learn from me. You become successful. More and more students come. More and more followers come to your temple. And your wish become fulfilled. Now you become that person, a famous monk. And then you look down. This parish is the key word. You look down to others. You know what? I'm better than you. You're nobody. I have more position, more follower than you. How many years do you ordain? How come you don't have follower? You see? The intention, the will, the attitude change. So now he get into that realm of becoming famous, and he look down others. He become intoxicated. He become addicted to that gain, that famous, that renounce, and he become careless. So the Buddha said, this monk will end up suffering, or dukkha. So if we put into picture, this is what happened. You ordain with good intention, right? You want to become a good monk, you want to end your suffering, you want to follow the, the teaching of the Buddha, and when you enter the Sangha or the monastic communities, you notice that, hey, I can become famous, and when I become famous, this is benefit I will gain. So you look for, you set goal to gain, okay, possession, follower, honor. And then you proud of yourself, and then you look down others. Not only that, you addicted to the gain and honor that you receive. You want more of that. Next time you give a talk, I want more listener. I want more students to come listen to my talk. I want more supporter to support me. You already feel into that trap. And the, the end of your journey, the Buddha said, you will end up suffering. You did not ordain for this. You did not ordain for free food for free shelter, for free ropes, for free medicine. You did not ordain for this. Your goal was aimed higher than this. But how come many monks get trapped in this? Okay, this is the first uh, uh, case that the Buddha mentioned in this teaching. I found another two sutras that combine together. It's just perfectly fit together about gain. So you are new in this monastic life. You are a new monk, I think. 
you you deserve to know this information because when Long Fi was first ordained, um, I don't heard much about this. Not many people give me the warning about not become famous, not become popular. But the Buddha actually, you know, com uh, he actually gave us the warning long time ago. He said, "Gain honor." Popularities are brutal, bitter, and harsh. They are an obstacle to reaching the supreme sanctuary. You will get lost. You will not achieve nibbana if you get trapped in the realm of these things. And he compared to the fisherman and the fish with the bait, right? Suppose a fisherman was cast a bait hook, this hook, into a deep lake. Seeing bait, fish would swallow the bait. And so, the fish that swallowed the hook would meet the tragedy and disaster, as the fisherman can do whatever he wants with it. Now the monk get hooked by fame, by gain, by popularities, without him knowing that, that he will end up suffering. He will end up suffering. If you're looking for a way to become famous, you can forget your privacy. Famous and privacy doesn't go together. And this is the Buddha himself. He talked to one of his attendants, Najita. May I, may I, I mean the Buddha, may I never become famous. May fame not come to me. The Buddha himself, he doesn't want to become famous. He doesn't. There are those who can, who cannot get the bliss of renunciation. That's why you look for happiness or bliss somewhere else. The bliss of seclusion. Are you guys happy here in the forest where not many people come and see you? Only a few monks, brothers. Are you happy? The bliss of peace, the bliss of awakening, okay, when, when they want, without trouble, difficulty like I can. So let them, I mean those monks, enjoy the filthy and lazy pleasure of possession or gain, honor or popularity. So the Buddha refused to become famous. And this day, maybe monk that you know that wants to become famous, I'd like you to think of your action, of your future. How can you remain safe for the rest of your monk's life without falling into the trap of the Mara like this? I don't want to be like that. I start to understand this teaching when someone becomes famous. When you become famous, you get hooked. This job is okay, but for me to engage with the people, I don't feel comfortable. So you guys be careful. You are young, good looking, you speak good English. When you give a talk, people want to listen. And then you will get addicted to that. Your ego will come. Now I'm a, I'm a teaching monk. Now I can teach people how to meditate. Now I can give the Dhamma talk. And then you will get lost in your spiritual journey. Be careful. And then the Buddha said, suppose a man needing the hardwood, he's seeking the hardwood, he's wandering in search for the hardwood. He came to a great, tea, a, a great tree standing, he found the tree, the tree basically, standing that the, this, this tree has the hardwood. Passing over its hardwood, its, its sapwood, its inner bark, its outer bark, and he would cut off the twig or the branches of the tree and the leaves and take them away, thinking that they were hardwood. A man looking for the tree, he wants to get the, hard, the hardwood of the, of the tree, but he ends up taking the branch and the leaf, thinking that this is the hardwood. Same thing, the monk who come and ordain, he looking for a way to end his own suffering, and now he finds that, oh, now I am happy now, because I become famous. I will continue doing this. Forget about Nibbana, I'm happy already. I'll show you the picture in a moment. Then a man with a good sight, someone with a good eyes, seeing that monk or that guy, he said that this good man, he did not know the hardwood or the sapwood or the inner bark or the outer bark or the twig or the leaf. Thus, while needing hardwood, while he's looking for hardwood, seeking for the hardwood, wandering in search for the hardwood, he came to a great, a great tree standing that this tree has everything, has hardwood, has uh, sapwood, has inner bark, has outer bark, but he cut off the twig and the leaf and took them away thinking they were hardwood. 
So this good, the man with good eyes see the man who take the leaf and the branches of the, the tree and leave, thinking that he has the hardwood. So he will not get his uh, goal fulfilled because he did not get the hardwood as he wished. He only take the leaf and the branches of the trees. And this is how the sutra lay down. It follows the same manner. So you may notice that the sutta repeated itself. So I will not repeat this sentence again and again, but I just want to show you the first, uh, the first comparison or the first simile that the Buddha used when a man comes and searches for the hardwood and he finds the leaf and the twig, thinking that this is the hardwood that he left. So he did not get what exactly that he was looking for. The following paragraph said, even so, now the Buddha refer back to that's what happened. That's why it's called simile, right? Amongst some young men, you guys, having gone forth or ordained from home to homeless, okay, with faith, you have faith. You have very good faith. That, you know what, I am a victim, I am subject to birth, aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair. I am a victim of dukkha or suffering. And surely, the ending of this whole mess of suffering can be found if I follow the teaching of the Buddha. Okay, he has a good intention. That's why he got himself ordained. So he gone forth, he ordained. And then he received gains, honors, and fame. And because of this gain, honor, and fame, he becomes satisfying. He please, he like it. His purpose is fulfilled. Now I'm happy and become famous. Because of the gain, honor, and fame, he lost himself he disparaged others, saying that it is I who am a recipient being famous, but those other monks are little known. Nobody knows you, little esteem. People know me more than you. Because of all of this, because of gain, honor, fame, and delight in this, he become lazy, become fall into the slot and being lazy. He dwell in suffering. Sometimes they use the word ill in suffering. Monk, this is called a monk who take a hole of the twig or the branches and the leaf of the Brahma fairing. And now we come to the new vocabulary. And because of this, he fail of the accomplishment. So this monk cannot achieve Nibbana or fully liberation because he already grabs something that's not important. It's not the core of the teaching, just the leaf and the branches of the tree. So the Brahma fairing is another term for the doctrine of the Buddha the teaching of the Buddha, or sometimes we call Pramachan or Brahmachan, the teaching of the Buddha. And then later on, the Sutta follow the same manner about what, is, what else that the monk grab instead of grab the hardwood, he grabs something else, which is not the essence or the core teaching of the Buddha. If you look at the tree, right, the tree has layer, has layer like this. This is the outer bark, the core is here, this is the hardwood. We, as a monk, our job, our goal is to get to this point, not addicted to some of these layers, to get to the core, get to the essence. This is the summary. This is the layout of the sutra. The Buddha already mentioned the first, the first group of monks who are addicted to gain and honor. This is the first group. It's called Lap Sakara in Pali, Lap Sakara, which is similar to Thai. A man ordained, you, you should looking for the hardwood, the core of the teaching, which is this one. Somehow, you only stuck with the first one, which is the leaf and the branches of the tree. So you don't get to the meat of the tree yet. And you're happy already. My ordination is done. I'm happy where I am. No need more training. But the hardwood itself is this one. And the second the second thing that the Buddha will mention after the, after the Lap Sakara or the gain and honor, which is this one, is called Outer Bark, this one. Outer Bark refers to Sila. And the Inner Bark, this one, refers to Samadhi. And the Sapwood, this, this brown one is called the Sapwood. It's the meat, but it's not the hardwood yet. This is called the Sapwood. Sapwood refers to Jnana uh, Tassana or knowledge and vision. So we will encounter some of the Pali term as well. I think it's necessary to understand it. The last one is called the hardwood, which is the 
เขาเจโตวิมุติเจโตวิมุติอกุปะอกุปะเจโตวิมุติ which translate to perpetual liberation so we just finished reading the first part and later on it go to the same manner the Buddha explained that oh the monk look instead of get the hardwood he looking for the outer bark so he trapped in the realm of sila uh, the third monk trapped on the realm of samadhi another monk trapped on the realm of y a n a t a s a n a no less and vision and some monk will make it through the last one which is the fully liberation this is how it look like when he gone forth when he ordained right he acquired gains and honor renounce but he is not pleased he's okay he don't get trapped in the realm of gain and honor he also does not account for it and lot himself and disparage others he does not become intoxicated with gain honor and renounce he does not grow negligence and fall into the negligence so what he does is being diligent the monks he achieve the attainment of virtue or sila now you overcome that first layer already now you enter to the next step of your training which is sila he is pleased with the attainment of virtue his intention is fulfilled and he also you think of you don't know anything about the monastic code you ordain you become a monk you learn the precept monk should observe precept this and that and you understand the patimokha And when you observe Patimokha, you look down your friend. That you know what I am stricter than you. I know more precept than you. Or you make mistake on it all the time. I never make mistake. You start look down other and you hold on that precept by looking down other that I am better than you. You always break precept. I never break precept. Again, this is not the goal of ordination. This the monk said, I am virtuous of good character, but these other bhikkhu or other monk they are immoral, they evil character. I'm better than you, and this also is one of the main reason why the sangha break into two group, because my teacher is stricter than you, my temple is stricter than you. I am in the forest, you are in the city. Forest monk is better than city monk. That's some people think like that. They hold on the idea of sila, use the sila as the indicator that you know this person is better than that person. I am better than you. So he become intoxicated, the attainment of the virtue, and then this also the Buddha said, this monk will be grow negligence, fall into the negligence, and he will end up suffering. He will go nowhere in his spiritual training. There are many story like this. Some monk, uh, one of the teaching the, uh, that found in the text that there was a monk who always he loved to clean the temple. After wake up, he clean the temple. He go arms round. Come back, finish his breakfast. He clean the temple, finish lunch. He clean the temple. He notice that his monk friend is meditating. Some monk do the chanting, but for him, no. I'm just gonna clean the temple. And he look down others that these people don't help me clean the temple. I am better than them, so I'm gonna keep doing this. No chanting, no meditate. He hold on that wrong view until he met with the arahant. Those arahant monk. You know, kind enough to let him know that you know what, monk, we have many duty. Cleaning the temple is just one minor duty. It's not your main duty. Why you become a monk? Did you ordain for this, or you ordain for something else? And that got the monk thinking. He have been holding that that thought and look down other for many years. That you know what, I am k h y a n I am diligent than you. You are lazy. You you meditate. You see, some monk don't meditate. Don't like meditation. Some monk like to clean. Some monk like to meditate. Be different, right? But you need to ask yourself, what is the essence of you becoming a monk in this rainy season, or in next year, or in the next five years? And it's go on, okay, from the virtue to the samadhi, the same manner. We will, uh, we we can go faster because it's the same manner. I will summarize to you in a moment, and then it's go on to the yana t a s a n a or no less and vision, and it's also the last one. Is called the liberation, perpetual liberation. Okay, asamaya vimoka, this one, which is this one. Okay, this is the whole picture of this particular sutra. And let's take a look at some of the vocabulary that you may not fully understand. Okay, sila, we kind of know that is the patimoka, is the monastic court. Okay, if you hold on that view too much, 
you will look down your friends. And this happened to my uh, some monk that I know as well. He always on time, always disciplines, always following the rules strictly, but he never smiles. He don't know what is meant by sabai. He always disciplines. Discipline first, the rule first. And get agitated with friends around him who are not always on time, not always keep things clean and organized, always complain others. And he himself cannot be happy. Something you need to take your time to understand, okay? Make sure that you are happy without compromising your precept. Understand the precept. Precept is not just for you to hold on to it, okay? It's the truth, it's the framework that when you live with precept, you can be mindful. When you are mindful, you can be aware from those defilement, greed, hatred, and delusion. It helps preventing those things to come and attack you. And then um, the word samadhi, we did talk about this, okay? Samadhi. This particular teacher or translator, or Bhikkhu Potri, he used the word concentration. And some translators, they use different words when it comes to the word samadhi, this one. This one, it's a concentration, right? Yeah, the word samadhi, he used the word concentrate and unconcentrate. So this monk, I am concentrate, you are unconcentrate. I meditate, you don't meditate. I meditate better, you don't meditate better than me, this and that. So you, you look down others, that's the idea. And the word, another word is called yana tasana. Sometimes Lumpi need to check to the Pali because I, I want to see how people translate from Pali to English. I want to see the vocabulary that's said exactly in Pali because it can give different meaning. So Yana Tasana is the one that I found in the text. Yana Tasana translates to knowledge and vision. Yana, yana means knowledge. Tasana means seeing. So together English translates to knowledge and vision. When you see, you know. This is Yana Tasana. Yana Tasana, we're talking about Apinya or the super knowledge. In this case, let's take a look at the six super knowledge. Start from psychic power. You can, you can do like this. This is Tevatatta, right? You can do like this. Uh, multiply yourself. You can walk on, on the surface of the ocean. You can dive yourself underneath the earth. You can do a lot of things. You have divine ear. You can read someone's mind. You can even recall your previous life. You can have the divine ear, divine eye, divine ear. You can hear things that people don't, don't hear. You can see things that people don't see. This is called five super knowledge. Tevatatta have all of this ability. He can do all of these abilities. He can read someone's mind. He can have psychic power. He is an advanced meditator. He's not just ordinary monk or regular monk or no, a beginner in meditation? No, he's not. He advanced. But he doesn't have the, the last power, I mean, the last super knowledge, which is the knowledge to, the ability or knowledge to remove the defilement completely from the mind. That's one he doesn't have. But he has these five yanathasana or super wisdom, super knowledge. You see, it's not easy for someone to have all of this. Even though people have all of this, if you cling on this, that I am a special person, I'm a super monk, I can read someone's eye, I can predict your future. You get recognition, people come to you and seek for your advice, and then you start you know, helping others in the wrong way, with the wrong view. Wrong view and the wrong way. You see, many temples sometimes provide the holy water, provide the amulet, provide all kinds of ceremony that may, you feel like this ceremony may help me to become free from my suffering or my problem. They may be, be able to read your mind. They may be able to predict the future. And myself, I have experienced such a person who can read my mind. And I know this is scientific. That is real. It's work. If you have good meditation, this is advanced meditation. When you get to that state of jhana, you can go on and on. You can develop all of this. But the Buddha said, no, this is not your goal. Please don't addict it to it. If you fall trapped into this realm, again, you will end up suffering. You will get lost in your spiritual development. Okay. And the word, um, uh, this one, liberation, or vimutti. You will hear this word a lot, vimutti. 
v i m u t i is this stage of mind. When you study the Buddhist text, you come across, you will come across this term v i m u t i And what is mean by v i m u t i v i m u t i is the right liberation, right revelation. v i m u t i okay. เจตวิมุตติยูโยมายอิสเดฟรีดอมออฟมายอิสเดดิลิเวเลนส์ออฟมายเดลิเบอร์เรชันทรูเดคอนเซนเทรชันแอนด์อินดิสปฏิคุลาทิชชิงเวนไอเช็คอินเดปาลีเดอะเวิร์ดเดย์ยูสอิสนอตจัสเจตวิมุตติเดอะอิสซัมติงอินฟอนอฟิตอิสคอลอากุปะอากุปะเจตวิมุตติอากุปะมีนอิสเออร์รีเวอร์ซิเบิลเวนยูเอทเทนดิสลิเบอร์เรชัน There's no other way around. You cannot come back. You on your way to be fully enlightened. That's called a k u p a c e t o v i m u t t i This is this is what it means. When you get to the last stage or the hardwood, you become a, a family member of the noble sangha. Noble sangha means the sangha who achieve a certain level of enlightenment. Start from the first level, s o d a p a t a n a or the stream enter, stream enterer. สกทาคามี or once returner, อนาคามี or non returner, and then the fourth step is called arahan. You think this is like the stream? You think of the water stream, right? When you enter the stream, this stream will take you to nibbana. You cannot come back. You on your way to be fully enlightenment for sure. When you attain the first state of enlightenment, you become soda patana. The text said it take you seven life. No more than seven life, you will achieve arahan. You will be fully extinguished. You will be fully liberated. So in this case, the hardwood of the teaching of the Buddha means that you are a part of either one of these. Start from the first level of enlightenment, you become the stream enterer. That's why it's called stream enterer. You enter the stream. Stream of what? Stream of liberation. It's irreversible. You on your way to be enlightened for sure. And one returner, that means you will reborn one time, one lifetime. Okay, non-returner, that means after that person die, that person will not come back to reborn as a human again. He will achieve enlightenment. Okay, in heaven, this one, this may be something that I add on for you. Okay, almost done. And this is the the opening paragraph that I mentioned, right? And it's end up here. The holy life, your ordination, does not have gain, honor, and renounce for its benefit. Or the attainment of sila, of virtue for its benefit, or the attainment of concentration or samadhi for its benefit, or the knowledge and vision, or y a n a t a s a n a for its benefit. But it is the uncheckable deliverance, akupa, b i m u t i this akupa c e t o b i m u t i of the mind that is the goal of this holy life. Is the hardwood is the end. So this one, the Buddha confirmed that this is the hardwood. This is the core. This is the essence why someone become a monk. This one, your job is to get here at least, get to the first stage of to achieve enlightenment, and then all the way up to become arahan and free yourself from dukkha. There is no other way around. Okay, so end up with this. b i k k u this special life. This is another sutra. Okay, but it's go together perfectly. This special life is live with the training of sikha, as its benefit. With panya or wisdom as its overseer, with freedom or vimutti as its core, you see the hard word here, and with sati or mindfulness as its ruler. I really like this short teaching when it come to, hey, what the benefit that I get when I become a monk? So the Buddha said this: this spiritual life, when you become a monk, okay, the first benefit you get is the sikha. Sikha means. Uh, you observe the precept. You develop the good manner. You develop good habits. This is the benefit that you get right away. Okay, it's called achara and kochara, or the monastic code or the manner that you develop when you become a monk. You train yourself to be a better person, a refined person, more and more refined mind as you walk down this spiritual path. And then you have a chance to develop panya. Panya is the aim. Buddhism press. Wisdom the most. You look for wisdom. That wisdom will help you to free yourself from suffering or v i m u t t i completely, completely. This is the core. And to do all this, you need to develop sati. Sati is the foundation. You see, we have 
a few important keywords here, the Sikha, the Panya. You can look at this as Sila, if you like. Panya, right? Panya is Panya. And Sati, of course, the Buddha point to Samadhi, because Sati will support Samadhi. And when you have Samadhi, Samadhi will support Panya. And with, with that Panya, of course, it will lead you to the fully liberation, which is called Vimutti. Now you see Sila, Samadhi, Panya, everywhere in his teaching. Any questions so far? Now you are here. This is the path of purification. You walk uphill. You walk again the stream of lust, of hate, of anger, of delusion, of greed. And your job is to get here, to realize or experience the supreme happiness and uncheckable freedom of mind, or Nibbana, or Vimutti, or Nirotha, you can call it anything that you feel comfortable, that you understand, it points to the same thing, uh, which is Nibbana in general. Okay? Not just become famous, not because of free food, not because of recognition, not because of um, I, I'm going to hone on my precept and I neglect the Samadhi and I look down others. I'm just going to meditate only. I will not clean the temple. I will not read the book. This is, all this is the wrong will. You need to find balance. Look at the ultimate goal and whatever helps you to get there faster, then do it. You read, you meditate, you clean the temple, you develop good habits, you mingle with your friends, you strengthen the, the, the unity of the Sangha. All of this is good. It's all considered good manner, good action, good activities. Okay? It's not just, oh, you know what, I'm going to meditate alone, don't talk to me, give me the tent, give me the food. I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to see anybody. When you're in the retreat, yes, you can do that. But in the reality, monk, we're not alone. We help each other, we support each other. I want to make sure that everyone's okay. You feeling not, if you're not feeling well, we want to make sure that you, you come back and have good feeling, then you can carry on your training. So we look after each other because our parent is not here. When you become a monk, we are brothers and we take care of each other. With that, I'm done for today. Sorry that I went over time. And this again, this sutra is 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 not easy uh, to understand right away, but at least you get the picture, okay, to see the idea of uh, the the core teaching of the Buddha, where the Buddha point us to when someone become a monk or live life as the uh, spiritual, uh, fully as the spiritual seeker. Okay, so we take a break. <laughs>